As the daughter of one of the most influential families of the period, Anne Boleyn played a role in both the rise and fall of Thomas Cromwell, while his part in the execution of Queen Anne Boleyn still resonates in the imaginations of many down through the centuries. In this episode, Dr. Lauren Mackay will explore Mantell's view of the early stages of this dangerous relationship. The Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer. So no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's all totally free with no catch. I highly recommend you give it a try. Download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to spotify.com slash podcasters to get started. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining this podcast today. I'm David Holland, and I'm the founder and organizer of an event that's taking place in England, in uh, the county of Devon, at a place called Cade House, a Tudor mansion, and it's called the Wolf Hall Weekend. This podcast is one in a series that we're running on the subject of Hilary Mantel's Wolf Hall Trilogy. And um, I'm thrilled today to be joined by Dr. Lauren McKay. Hello, Lauren. Hello, thank you for having me here Pleasure. and at the weekend. Yeah, thrilled too that you're going to be joining us at the weekend. Yeah, absolutely. We've got some great speakers. There's yourself, there's Dr. Elizabeth Norton, there's uh, Professor Dermot McCulloch. Uh, some people will have heard of him. Uh, we've even got some actors, Ben Miles and some other. Anyway, we're it, the whole concept of the weekend is really to celebrate not just the amazing achievement of Hilary Mantel in the 2,000-page trilogy, a magnificent feat of history in a way, uh, although it's fiction, but also her own personal genius and generosity of spirit. And um, places are booking up fast, so if anybody's interested, uh, go to wolfhallweekend.com and see uh, what we're up to there. Today, Lauren, we've decided to talk about Anne Boleyn. I mean, hey. she's uh, such an underrated <laughs> starlet. <laughs> Tudor history, why not talk about Anne Boleyn? So how many Anne Boleyns are there, according to various historians? Um, you know, several hundred, I would have thought. Um, in your book, for those who, who are not familiar with Dr. Lauren McKay, who has actually been on this podcast before, um, uh, Lauren, you're the author of The Wolf Hall Companion, That's um, right. which is the only companion that I'm aware of anyway, um, about Hillary's series where you try and help the reader and the fan of the, of the series to understand some of the more historical, hopefully accurate um, aspects of that. And in your take on Anne Boleyn, and I'll just quote you here, and then I'm going to quote something from Hillary herself, but... Um, you say that Mantell has reimagined Anne Boleyn, and this has caused considerable controversy. <laughs> uh, we, well, historians, we love that, don't we? Um, <laughs> more the merrier. Uh, Mantell's Anne is a calculated being a with a cold, slick brain, quote Hillary, um, at work. Her eyes are not beautiful. According to Hillary, they are hungry. And throughout the series, Cromwell never warms to Anne. Although, as I was chatting to you earlier, there is a, a slightly different take on that in the TV series um, on the first two books. <laughs> yes. Um, I recall it well, yes, where Cromwell um, fantasizes, I think, about having an intimate relationship with Anne when they're staring out of the window at the demise of, of Thomas More. Maybe it's the lust of power that uh, overcame him. Who knows? But um, So let's talk about... Anne Boleyn, as if she hasn't been talked about enough, there's still plenty more to say, I think. I want to just quote us um, from the beginning um, of the first book, Wolf Hall in the series, where um, Hillary's sort of bringing, bringing us up to speed on the relationship between Wolsey, Cardinal Wolsey, for whom Cromwell worked at the time, and um, the what's already happened in in the life the early life of Anne Boleyn, and um, he do, she does it very cleverly through a, a sort of charade that um, uh, George Cavendish, who is a servant of, of Wolsey, p 
plays with uh, Thomas Cromwell, where he says, well, look, you imagine you're Wolsey, um, he says, and, um, you know, I'll play some of the other parts. Well, some of the other parts, of course, are um, Mr. Percy, Harry Percy. And so let's talk a little bit about Harry Percy, because according to the history, as far as I'm aware, but certainly in this account that Hillary portrays here, he claims to be as good as married to Anne Boleyn. What do we know about the facts of that that period? Well, you know, it's interesting. Just to quickly, when you when you say that, um, obviously in the Wolf Hall Companion, I said that Mantel had reimagined Anne. What Mantel did, and she and she's done this with a number of characters, is to to sort of draw from the history uh, some of these elements that perhaps we don't tend to see quite so often. So when we when we see Anne Boleyn in, in a lot of the historical uh, uh, reconstructions of her life, we, we there's a lot of romance, there's passion, there's sensuality. But uh, of course, she's ambition and uh, ambitious, and she does have a bit of a ruthless streak, and it does come out. And so I think she's basically she what hillary did she she lent into these uh less known and she does that of course with thomas more as well as you know we all think about a, a thomas more and a man for all seasons but she draws on the the slightly more negative elements of his personality which are there which are present in the in the sources so it's you know she's not maybe i'm wrong to even say she's reimagining but she's <laughs> she's certainly bringing out uh elements that we don't tend to associate with these characters now as to this part of Anne's life with Henry Percy, it's such a muddle because we don't have so much evidence to go on. We really only have uh, Cavendish and I think Edward Hall and a couple of other sources. And it's it seems to be some sort of infatuation between Henry Percy and obviously Anne Boleyn. She's a, a gentleman's daughter. She's a daughter of a diplomat and a courtier. Uh, she's from good stock, but it's obviously not quite as high as the as the Percy stock. Um, of course, they are the Dukes of Northumberland. Oh, well, well, yes. And so, I mean, there's this sort of difference in status. Um, but we also don't know how far the relationship has gone. So Mantell obviously taps into some of the more well-known retellings of this particular narrative that they have wedded and bedded secretly. They are as good as married. It's a done deal. And Anne Boleyn is hoping that they're just going to kind of weather the storm and see it through and come out the other end. But of course, she's got this immovable uh, structure in Wolsey. He's the haughty beast in Scarlet, as he's often called, and he's not going to get out of the way. Now, uh, we tend to see this in history, and certainly Mantell, uh, I think, probably agreed with this. This was really that sort of that, that genesis of antagonism between Wolsey and Anne and that hatred that we sometimes see come out in Anne Boleyn towards Wolsey in later years. I actually, and I don't mean to be controversial, but I don't necessarily believe it. I actually think that, I mean, whatever dalliance Henry Perse had with Anne Boleyn, I, I, don't, I just don't believe that it went as far as some of the, the sources sort of try mm. to suggest. And I don't really see, I mean, because what I find the issue with this is this idea that after Wolsey blocks this marriage between Anne Boleyn and uh, and Henry Percy, and of course in Wolf Hall, he doesn't even, Wolsey doesn't even talk to Anne. He has the, the meeting with Thomas Boleyn and, the, and Thomas Boleyn is standing there unflinching as Wolsey berates him for his daughter having this, having this dalliance. And Mantel's Cromwell actually says, she sa he says to himself, Thomas Boleyn is one of the coldest, slickest men he's ever seen. Hmm. Or something to that effect. So of, of, of tapping into this uh, father-daughter connection there in the Boleyn family. But we don't, there's no real evidence. I, I just don't believe that. I don't think he would have absolutely ever berated Thomas Boleyn for this relationship. I don't think Thomas Boleyn even really knew much about this relationship. But I also don't believe that Anne Boleyn was such a person to, uh, th that this would ruin her entire um connection with Wolsey or future relationship with Wolsey. I think she's more pragmatic than that. I think that what we're doing there is kind of feeding into this idea that she is just so blinded by rage. She is so emotionally unhinged that she's going to ruin Wolsey, but it just suits a narrative, doesn't it? Yeah, and, and, well, 
So, sorry, to, uh, why did um, Wolsey stand in the way of of this relationship? What's the mo- What's his motivation? Simply because you know, marriages, um, and you know, we can't go by Henry VIII, but marriages aren't about romance, and they're not about love. These are matters of politics, and when you are a very powerful family, and especially uh, Suffolk, Norfolk, uh, Northumberland, these are mm. very old and ancient titles, and they they signify uh, a great deal. And so, just to marry into this family, into these families, you can't just be anybody. There have to be political alliances. It has to be strengthening, bolstering positions and and allegiances, and. Also, I think that there already was um, a, a particular match that Wolsey had in mind, and it was it was a right, and it was a match that was going to benefit both parties. And also, once a match is made, it's very difficult to extricate mm. uh, one half out, and it's it, it it leaves a bad taste in everybody's mouth. Um, but it's just not what it's just not done. And it's not personal. This is the thing. And I think we, we, we see this a lot, that there's this sort of personal enmity between Wolsey and Anne that Wolsey never liked. And we see this in some of the fictional interpretations, I believe, in, in the, the Showtime series, The Tudors. I think mm. Wolsey, played brilliantly by Sam Neill, uh, says, you know, what would, what would a silly girl like you have to say to a king? Uh, there's this condescending attitude that comes out in fictional interpretations that's not really there in the history. It's not personal, but she's not, but the Boleyns aren't a, a, a suitable match for, for the Percys, and it's as simple as that. But but then again, I think that Thomas Boleyn, even if, if, whatever he had heard about it, if indeed he had been involved at all, and I really doubt he was, he would have completely agreed. Absolutely, this would cause considerable havoc, and it's it's just not done. But I just don't believe that Anne Boleyn was so so angered and so enraged by this potential thwarting of a match that she would then set her sights on Wolsey for the rest of his life. There's just no for the rest of her life, I should say. There's just no evidence. So Mantel definitely has Anne as a political um, aspirant. She, according to Mantel, the key reason from her point of view in marrying Harry Percy was for his title, according to um, the account by Cavendish in this little play that he's staged for Cromwell's be- on Cromwell's behalf. Um, he also says... And, and they're referring back to 1527, I checked, even though this account, this this little playlet is happening in 1529 in Hillary's book. He said, can you think how we laughed, said Cavendish. He says, some sallow chit, forgive me, a knight's daughter to menace my Lord Cardinal, her nose out of joint because she could not have an earl. But we could not know how she would rise and rise. And then she said, then he goes on to say, because when the king said, Mistress Anne is not to marry Northumberland, I think, I think, the king had his eye cast on her all that long time ago. Yes. Uh, Any grounds for that or not? I don't intend to disagree with everything you're saying this evening, David, I promise. (laughs) (laughs) No, no, I'm... (laughs) I feel this like is I'm going to. fact and fiction. No, let's do it. Come it on. might, it might be, it might be this dreadful cold I have, but I'm just feeling very riled up about all of this. But um, no, come on, go for it. <laughs> uh, again, I, I think that, and, and Mantel says this: the problem with Anne Boleyn is we always tend to read her story backwards, and mm. so we're always looking for the moment that Henry VIII has fallen in love with her. We're always looking for reasons why her her life took uh, certain turns and twists at, at certain times. But I again, there's just there's no real evidence that Henry VIII was in love with Anne Boleyn at this time and asked Wolsey to thwart the match. Right. Because then again, later on, when the rumours swirl around court several years later that uh, about and, and this resurfaces this romance or this little fling that Anne had with Henry Percy reaches the king's ears, and and the sources suggest that he's quite confronted by this as if he wasn't already aware that this had taken place. So that that it, it doesn't really make sense that he would have 
we've been aware of a dalliance going on between Northumberland or Henry Percy, I should say, and Anne, and and simply tried to thwart it because he wanted her for himself. Again, there were far more far more political elements at play here, and I he, I don't think he would have approved of the match either. So it's a lovely story if we're working backwards, but I don't think it's that the moment that Henry VIII suddenly realizes he wants Anne Boleyn, or as as Cromwell and I think Cavendish call her the the sister, the flat chested one rather disparagingly. Yeah, very disparagingly. And of course, Henry was having an affair with Mary Boleyn well in, yes. well in advance of his dalliance eventually with Anne. Um, and I just wonder whether or not um, the, I don't know, whether in Mantell's mind, uh, because Mary Boleyn was spoiled goods, according to uh, her account, she's been passed around the French court um, yes. several times with her sister, in, you know, following in her coattails. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Which I thought was a lovely way of yes. putting it. But certainly, I mean, I'm sure many of the listeners have seen the uh, the the movie, uh, the the other Berlin. Um, oh yeah. Yeah, which which is quite a, an interesting take on that. But anyway, I, I, I'd like us to move on, if that's okay. Yes. Things progress quite rapidly uh, between Cromwell and Anne, uh, although my take on the way that uh, Mantell has Anne viewing Cromwell is is always with a slight distaste. Sort of like, yeah. you know, he's always a bad smell in the room as far as she's concerned, but he's useful. Um, she she has this habit of calling him Cremwell. Yes. Because she has a French accent, apparently. Affectation. Uh, she, an affectation, yes, yeah, certainly. Um, and by the middle of the book, certainly in the middle of the Wolf Hall uh, story, um, the... You know, Wal she's been instigative in the downfall of Wolsey, as we know, um, and in a way has taken advantage of Henry's lust towards her. A sort of a Mantel almost has it as a sort of like a taming of the shrew type relationship. Um, and they've, but in the Cromwell and uh, Anne have formed an alliance. How how reliable is is that? Overcooked? Do you think in in the in the um, trilogy or not? No, I, I you know I I think I think Mantell understands the complexity of the relationship between Cromwell and Anne, and she understands that it's not they they are aligned for one purpose and one purpose only at at least initially, and that is the annulment pleasing the king, obviously in different ways, mm. but certainly um, there's no great love between them, nor, nor has there really been any evidence of such. We, we Cromwell knew Thomas Boleyn relatively well because they, mo they both moved in the same circles and uh, Thomas Boleyn served, as I said before, Wolsey in a diplomatic capacity and Cromwell is in the household. So the paths have crossed. And we also know, by the way, that Thomas Boleyn's sister, actually, she required some legal assistance and Thomas Boleyn uh, wrote to Cromwell suggest, uh, asking if he could be of any assistance to his sister. So there, uh, and which Cromwell actually, he does. He be, he tries to counsel uh, Thomas's sister and helps her in, and tries to help her in a legal matter and then recommends other solicitors. So there, there's, there's, there are some examples there of a, a good working relationship between Thomas and Cromwell, but Anne and Cromwell, there's 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 no real, really very close relationship. I don't know necessarily that Anne had disdain for Cromwell. I mean, certainly he is linked to Wolsey, and so that might be that there might be that slight slight emotional friction there. Hmm. But they they you know for the for 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 the most part they're working together, but their goals are aligned at least initially. Yes. There's this lovely scene right in the middle of um, the first book, Wolf Hall. Uh, I'll just read a few lines from it because it sets the scene and it also introduces uh, Thomas More uh, yes. because Thomas More was the great thorn in the flesh of Anne. Um, and, yes, uh, Robert Bolt, uh, A Man for All Seasons, brings that out beautifully, of course. Um, 
Um, and Mantel, I've always thought I agree with you. Um, I've heard you say that in a way Mantel is almost counteracting the mythology that was created yes. through through that. Yeah. Subverting the tropes, and I think it's it's high time that that we do that. I think what's lovely about the Wolf Hall trilogy is you 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 almost don't recognize anybody, in a <laughs> sense, and yet and yet there is something in all of them that has been taken from the sources because we do know that Thomas More could be cruel. We do know that, and, and as Mantel says, uh, he would for, Thomas More would for a difference in your Greek kill you. This mm. is really Thomas More. He's he might he might be saint and he, he might be uh, you know very much you know the paragon of virtue uh, now. Uh, but there is, there are elements to him which are questionable and which cannot be ignored. And I think what Mantel's done is she said, and I'm not going to ignore them. Here they are. Here are all those elements for everyone to see. And it's and it's come from the sources. So here's here's a a, a lesson for every would be author in how to portray a scene of gloating. Uh, the next day, she says. Cromwell stands in the gallery at Whitehall, which looks down on an inner court, a garden, where the king waits and the Duke of Norfolk busies to and fro. Anne is in the gallery beside him. She's wearing a dark red gown of figured damask, so heavy that her tiny white shoulders seem to droop inside it. Sometimes, in a kind of fellowship of the imagination, he imagines resting his hand upon her shoulder and following his thumb, uh, he scoops out the hollow between her collarbone and her throat and imagines his forefinger tracking the line of her breast as it swells above her bodice as a child would follow a line of print. I'd forgotten she wrote that. I, I, thought, I thought they just made it up. Okay, um, <laughs> never mind. Mantel wrote it. <laughs> so... Um, I, I, you know, that's I, about I think, that's as steamy as the whole that's that's the steamiest yeah. scene in the whole trilogy. This is not but a bodice ripper. <laughs> no, but I think Mantel's Cromwell, he is he is transfixed by Anne in a way, but almost as if she's she's something that he's wondering how far I don't know, there's something breakable about Anne to him, I think. And he's one mm. and I almost sometimes I almost wonder if 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 her if her Cromwell is wondering just if he presses a little harder, will he break her? Mm. And will she shatter? Um, she is because she tend Mantel tends to use these kinds of words that you know she is brittle, she is uh, sharp, and and there is there is something about that. And I think that, uh, I, but I don't think the real Cromwell really entertained any such thoughts about Anne Boleyn. I think it was work, 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 business, business, business. But certainly there is this 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 lovely kind of. Um, he does. He doesn't. He, he's wary of her, but she is. She is. I don't know. She is something to sort of. I don't know. She's almost untouchable to him, isn't she? Really, and yet he sort of wants to touch her, as if she. Are you real? And will you break? Yes. Yes. Um, uh, looking down on Thomas More, who's just arrived, um, and she says, turning her head to him, "Here he comes. He's not wearing the Lord Chancellor's chain." What could he have done with it? Thomas More looks round-shouldered and despondent. Um, and then Cromwell says, well, no, it's, it's in the bag. You know, he's, he's carrying it in a bag. Yes. And um, right at the end of that scene, so there's it's almost a gloating, a, a complicit gloating of what they've managed to, to, to bring this man down, who had the affections of Henry, um, a man on whom he relied. He was almost like people have said, you know, Moore was was uh, Henry's conscience. Um, mm. Certainly, Thomas Bolt, uh, Robert Bolt would would like us to think that, um, and that he, you know, in a way, um, Henry was siding with the devil, according to that, you know, that narrative, yeah. when when he decided to execute uh, Moore. Um, but there's that lovely, just finish here, but just this lovely little, at the end of that scene, when um, the the two men confront each other, Cromwell and Moore, and so Cromwell asks Moore, what are you going to do now? And he says, write and pray. And then Cromwell says, my recommendation would be to write only a little and pray a lot. <laughs> <laughs> is that a threat? Moore is smiling. It may be. My turn, don't you think? Um, when the you know, king's and when the king saw Anne, his face lit up. 
his heart is ardent, in his counsellor's hand it burns to the touch. Yeah. So it's one, of the, it's one of the few times Henry's ever said goodbye to someone, isn't it? Which is, I think makes it all the more poignant. Normally, the people who displease him are, are gone and there's never any sort of conversation. Yeah, he, he goes into <laughs> denial, yes. Well, he certainly went into yeah. denial with the when he dispatched Anne. We, just for the listener's benefit, we, we, we may end up referencing uh, Anne's final demise, but we're, uh, we're sort of trying to concentrate, in this episode anyway, um, on the early days of um, Anne and Cromwell. So on, yeah. let, let's keep on that track just for a bit longer. Um, by the time we get sort of towards the end of the first book, uh, we've got Anna's queen, and she's wanting to consolidate her power um, with the final execution of Moore, and she's pers pers managed to persuade Henry that, that he's got to go. And Cromwell says that it won't be easy. Um that tells me that in Hillary's view, the whole notion then of the final demise of Moore was instigated by Anne. Yes. This this was Anne's Anne driving this particular yeah. it was her motive to get rid of what, what do you think of that? Do you I I, I actually I, I was surprised when I read that in Wolf Hall, because it mm. does tend to line up with a lot of other fictional interpretations. We've seen this and the driving force and forcing this hapless, moronic king uh, to execute <laughs> people who loves. And I just think that do, that, that it, it, all, it sort of does Henry a disservice there in a way because Henry is ruthless. Mm. Henry does not like to be challenged. He does not like to be abandoned by his friends and he does like to punish in very particular ways, namely execution. Mm. Uh, and I don't think he needed much pushing at all to get rid of Moore. Moore was, as you say, he was Henry's conscience. Quite frankly, Moore thought he was everybody's conscience. But <laughs> certainly to Henry, to not have Moore's approval He'd already lost Wolsey and he'd never had Wolsey's approval of this of this marriage. And to then to not have Moore's, it is it's unfathomable to him. And he is, I think he is furious. I think he, he his love for Moore has turned to hate. I think if I mean this is but this is just textbook Henry. I've never seen, I've never known a man or or indeed a person like Henry who can love so deeply and for that to sour so quickly into into this visceral hatred for the same person he wanted to punish more because he never had that acceptance and it, it more was a father figure to him and so he's he's almost it, it's 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 banishing one's father his father figure uh i don't i don't think anne obviously she wasn't going to intercede for more i think she was fully supportive of this of this fact but i think for henry it was almost like just just severing that last tie to truly free himself and then he is absolutely unfettered by any 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 anyone's uh, outside control he has his he's, he's power and he's not and once he has done this it really does open the door to uh, every other move that he now makes over the next few years the, the violent strokes of logic that he applies to politics for the next sort of five to ten years. Mm. Yeah, I mean, Mantel does um, play into this notion that the motivation came from Anne in relation yes. to the execution more. Um, on page 630 in my edition, she says, the Queen was sick with frustration. She wanted an example made, and affairs in France are not going her way. Some say that at the mention of her name, Francoise Sniggers, she suspects, and she is right, that her man Cromwell is more interested in the friendship of the German princes than in an alliance with France, but she has yes. to pick her time for that quarrel. So yes. she says that she'll have no peace till Fisher is dead or until Moore is dead. Yes. Um, and then... But at the yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, but I was going to say, but at the same time, getting rid of Moore and Fisher don't necessarily help international diplomacy at no. all. In fact, they are so getting so I, I don't think that Anne ever saw them as some sort of 
obstacle to to a French uh, rapprochement. There, there's nothing. I, I don't think the two are linked there. I just think that obviously. Um, uh, but I, but I, I think that I think that Hillary had a pretty low opinion of Henry, and that I completely am on board with. Mm. You know, I understand where she's coming from in that sense but <laughs> certainly i i think just getting rid of fisher and more was just for just for henry as i said just it's about getting rid of those two the, you know the, the the really part of the old guard who always opposed him yeah um in the next couple of paragraphs um when uh he says um fisher gives me no anxiety cromwell says his offense is clear in Moore's case, morally, our cause is unimpeachable. No one is in doubt of his loyalty to Rome and his hatred of your majesty's title as the head of the church. Legally, however, our case is slender and Moore will use every legal and every procedural device to open him. This is not going to be easy. Now, um, lovely literary um, device here because... When Cromwell says this is not going to be easy, that's like a trigger to Henry. And so Henry goes off in a bit of a rage and turns back to Cromwell and says, do I retain you for what is easy? Jesus, pity my simplicity. I have promoted you to a place in this kingdom that no one, not even your um, breeding, no one of your breeding has ever held in the whole of history of this realm. Not true, actually. Uh, Wolsey was of equal low. Yes, I was going to say, I'm pretty sure he was following <clears throat> in some footsteps there. Yeah, I think yeah. he was well in Wolsey's <laughs> footsteps. So again, you know, his, um, I think, you know, Henry is also quite famous for his amnesia, is he not? Um, he would you yes. know, ha happily oh, yes. remember. Yeah. Completely selective amnesia, yes. <laughs> yes. So he says, I keep you, Master Cromwell, because you are as cunning as a bag of serpents but do not be a viper in my bosom. You know my decision, execute it. Yes. And as he leaves, he is conscious of the silence falling behind him and walking to the window and Harry, Henry staring at his feet. So Cromwell's um, put in his place by Henry, but I personally, I'm going to go with you in a way, I doubt that a conversation like that ever took place. It may have taken place in Mantell's image of of Anne. Certainly, you know, that. Yes. <clears throat> but I, I think that Mantell. I, I think Mantell is trying to foreshadow there as well, suggesting that because Henry's Henry's cold detachment from Anne, I think, doesn't just come from nowhere. I think this is Henry beginning to tap into his own sense of power, but also he starts to look around him at the men he has made, the whim, the woman he has made, and he is starting to think of himself. I can, I as as Mantel says, I can unmake all of you, if you don't serve my purpose, I can unmake all of you. And I think it's it's he he is he is checking Cromwell here. And yet, uh, by all accounts, from what we can see, the you know the only time really that Henry does this, uh, at least publicly, is uh, is that mm. final Easter right before Anne is executed. Mm. Um, not to go into bring up the bodies, just very quickly, David, but uh, because it's about politics, and it's when it's when it's when Cromwell overreaches himself politically, and I think that Mantel has taken she she has been influenced by that by that later. Uh, altercation between Henry Cromwell and Ulster Chapuis, the imperial ambassador, uh, in Easter of 1536, and she has brought it back here to sort of show it's it's simmering, it's there, and it's growing. Um, and as I said, it's a it's a it's a foreshadowing. Here is Henry beginning to understand hmm. what he what the, the 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 limitlessness of his power. In your book, in your description of Anne Boleyn. And uh, you're sort of reflecting on uh, Mantell's version of Anne. In the last paragraph, you say, in the series, Cromwell sees only calculation in Anne, which is beautifully um, sort of imaged uh, in the uh, comment, I think, which came from Mary Berlin, that Anne is selling herself by the inch. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> 
But the, the real Anne had every right to demand more from Henry. She was the daughter of a well-respected man of court. She came from a good family, and she was worth something. Yes. But it was all calculated. You believe in the end there was I, no... I, you know, it's it's interesting because I think I finished that by quoting Mantel, and she has Anne say, I was always desired, but now I am valued. I and think that that's is a very different says, thing. Yes. And that's a very different thing I find. And I think that that to me is has is the beauty because I, I think um, Anne Boleyn does have, and this is not to say that she was just only calculation, but I think she is thinking pragmatically here. But I, I don't like to deny Anne of any true emotion for Henry. I don't like to deny her of any of any humanity there. And I think that's what we tend to do so often by by promoting this, uh, the ambition and, and that agenda uh, at the expense of any really human emotions that she might have felt for Henry. I think at the very beginning, I, I think she was pursued. I think it was a relentless pursuit on Henry's part. I think that her father tried to protect her. He takes her down to Heva. But I think as matters evolve, she starts to well, why not? Why can't I? Why can't I follow this path? Um, whatever she feels for Henry, and I, I, I think she obviously felt something for him. If this is a seven-year courtship followed by the marriage. Mm. Um, I don't think that, and um, I don't think that you can just be driven by a single ambition for for so long. I think she cares. She becomes emotionally invested. She, be, I think, she does fall in love with Henry. But right. I understand what where Mantel is coming from in this. Um, in just in sort of just really bringing out that the 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 ambition and that particular the, the political agenda rather than bringing out uh, love because I think that Cromwell is a very unemotional character as well and I think that's what he notices about Anne uh, that, that's what her I should say her Cromwell notices about Anne and he recognizes that because he has these kinds of qualities himself it's about well getting ahead okay when and, and this is and, and this is the agenda and the trajectory I'm going to follow. But um, it, it's a controversial way to view Anne, and I, it, uh, I think though it, she, what Mantel is also giving uh, Anne, there is political agency, where sometimes she is robbed of that agency as well. She's seen only as a pawn. I think Mantel is saying, no, she's not a pawn. She knows exactly what she's doing. Is it a little bit to one side? Yes, perhaps. But I absolutely understand what she's trying to say with this particular version of Anne Boleyn. Right. We've just got a couple of minutes left. Um... For this session um i'm i'm probably going to have you back <laughs> lauren <laughs> when you're feeling a bit more up, up to speed um <laughs> and we'll talk about uh the the more sort of dramatic part of uh, anne's life but yeah. i've often thought that if you really want to know the full nature of anne <clears throat> why not have a look at her daughter queen elizabeth the first um there is a you know, she's the daughter of two very powerful people, you know, personally powerful people. Um, and whilst, you know, in her her speech uh, at the uh, halfway through the Armada, she says, you know, I have the heart and the constitution of a man. Um, mm -hmm. She probably also had the heart and constitution of her mother, which was yeah. you know, equally strong, equally powerful and um, a great testimony, in a way, to Anne's determination and courage to to stick it out. And uh, I think, you know, it, it's a pity we um, we don't have another series, another Mantel series on the Elizabethans. But that would that, that would well, have been. Well, although Mantel wasn't a great fan of Elizabeth either in Wolf Hall, I think she says that uh, yeah. she. she she says that she has uh, that Cromwell has never seen it that Elizabeth's eyebrows are bristling and he's never seen a child so ready to take offense as <laughs> yeah. Princess Elizabeth. So I don't know that Mantel would have gone for that. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> no. I'm not sure what she really thought of Elizabeth actually. <laughs> well, thanks so much, Lauren, for you know joining me today. I hope everyone's enjoyed this session as much as I have. Um, we could keep going all day. There's no question. <laughs> yes. Um, and we've got 2,000 pages to choose from yes. um, with lots of great characterizations. Thank you so yeah. much. And um, we'll be back. We'll be back. And just to remind everybody, if you're interested in joining us for the weekend next year, wolfhallweekend.com. Um, take a look, have a look at all the speakers, and we hope we'll, uh, you'll be joining us then. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. 
You can follow and support the Tudor's Dynasty podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Patreon at Tudor's Dynasty.